in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And everything he made was good and right. But man chose to sin and turn away from God. In this way, sin entered the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men. But God had a plan to save us from sin and death. Rich in mercy, because of his love for us, he sent his only son, Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect life, and though he never sinned, he became sin for us. He who should not have tasted death drank the bitter cup of God's wrath on our behalf. He stood at a trial, and no one could find guilt in him, but still they cried, crucify him. So they took Jesus, bearing his own cross, to Calvary's hill. And stars they wept, the morning sun was dead, the savior of the world was fallen, his body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. One final breath again, as heaven looked the Son of God was there in darkness, a battle in the dark, the war on death was lost, a power for the Toward the dawn of the first day of the week, the women went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, rolled back the stone and sat on it. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love cannot. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for his glory. Come worship the one who has conquered the grave. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your
Amen. It is so good to see you today. Welcome home. If you could, if there's space on your row, could everyone scoot to the right? All right, trying to make as much space as we can. If you have any empty seats on the right, let's scoot down. Come on, let's celebrate the resurrection. Let's see. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels sing. Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. together. He's our king. He's alive. Come on. Here we go. Let's wake up. I wish I could tell you. Wish I could describe it. But I can't contain it. Can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture. And not enough words to ever say what I find. Wonderful. Wonderful and beautiful. Yeah. 
Praise God. Man, I love that song. And you know what that song reminds me? Is that while kings come and go, and kingdoms they rise and fall, we serve a king who's gonna reign forever. And he's bringing us with him, amen? Well, hey, it's Easter, so let's do this together. Ready? He is risen. Turn to those around you, let them know our king is risen, and take a seat. Welcome home. You know, we say that a lot around here, and that's because we mean it. We want this place to be home for you. We're a family. In fact, family is our theme word for the year. We don't want this to be a place where people come and go. Our desire is that we would be a community of people who follow Jesus together. The key word there is together because we weren't meant to do life alone. And to that end, once a year, we do an Easter connection card, which you'll find in the seat back in front of you. Do me a favor, everyone in the room, grab one of these right now. There should be a few in the seat backs in front of you. Grab one, everyone, whether you're a member who's been coming for years, or this is your first time in this building, grab one of these. This isn't our normal connection card. It's our Easter connection card, and it's different, I promise. We're asking everyone in this room to fill this out this morning, whether you're a member or it's your first time and everyone in between. 
You might say, why? Why are we asking everyone to fill this out? It's because we believe that everyone has a next step to take. And since we love you and care about you, we want to be able to come alongside you in whatever your next step is. So if you look at the card, you'll see there's some basic information. And then there's an opportunity at the bottom to mark maybe what your next step might be. And then on the back, you can write prayer requests or any questions that you have. And listen, we're not going to call your phone. We're not coming by your house unannounced. We're not even asking for your address. All that we're going to do is send you an email. We'll send you an email that will give you the opportunity to allow us to walk alongside you as you take your next step. So again, if you don't have one in your hands, get one of these in your hands, all right? Be filling it out. You can fill it out while I'm talking. You can fill it out when the sermon gets boring. Um, Just know that this is your ticket out of the room, all right? When you leave, we're gonna have people collecting these, all right? So make sure you fill this out at some point during the service. You know, we're excited because today we're not only celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, but we're also celebrating baptism. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, ready? I'll give you something to clap about. We got seven baptisms this weekend. Yeah, give a hand for that. That's awesome. And you know, any day is a good day for baptism, but Easter especially. See, baptism, it doesn't save you, but it's something that all Christians are called to do. We're all called to be obedient by publicly displaying what Christ has done in our lives. And why Easter makes this so special is because what we celebrate today is that Jesus, though he was dead and buried, he rose from the grave, defeating death. And what baptism is, it's this symbol. When we go under that water, symbolically, we are being buried with Christ in baptism and then raised up in newness of life. Because that's what Jesus bought for us on the cross, is that the old can pass away so that the new can come. And so we're excited this morning. In this service, we have two folks getting baptized. We have Lucas Earls and Jacob Asbury. And we are so, yeah, clap for that. That's awesome. Yeah. And so if y'all would, let's stand and worship together and celebrate baptism. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart is given a name But my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to death when death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made. Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, faithfully born. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested in my
Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hell. Yes, he did. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, oh your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now life begins with you. It's your thankful for the cross and empty graves. Say amen. amen. Have a seat. Welcome home. Take a moment. Turn to your neighbor and say, he is risen. He is risen. Now, turn to the neighbor you were trying to avoid <laughs> and say, hey, don't forget to fill out that connection card. Tell him right now. Tell him, fill it out. Now, pick someone and I want you to ask them the greatest question you could ask any day, especially on Easter. I want you to look right at them, look them in the eyes, and ask this question. Ask them, did you lose weight? <laughs> Today, we are celebrating the greatest event in human history, an event that demarcated history, Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. It separated time into B.C. and A.D., we are celebrating today the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you didn't know, resurrection literally means raising from the dead. Jesus is alive. And Christianity alone worships a living God. See, listen, the difference between Christianity and every other world religion is our God's alive. Every other world religion was founded by men or prophets who were still in a grave today. You can travel with me and we can visit the Temple of the Tooth in Sri Lanka, a world-renowned place of worship where the left tooth of Gautama Buddha is enshrined. You can go to the Temple of Confucius and worship and practice Confucianism. You can go to the Mosque of the Prophet Muhammad where millions will travel to the final resting place of Muhammad to worship. 
But Christians have no such place. You can go to Jerusalem and walk where Jesus walked. You can go to the hill where he was crucified. You can even visit the empty tomb many believe belonged to him. But you cannot visit his grave. Because Christianity alone worships a living God. Paul, who was saved by Jesus, sent out by Jesus, wrote much of the New Testament, said this. Now I want you to help me read. And if Christ has, our preaching is... And so is your faith. So if Jesus is not alive, we all look so nice today, right? But we're wasting our time. Because Jesus may have been a very good man, but he's a very dead man. Dead men can't help you. And dead gods can't do anything for you. Dead gods can't do anything. But, But a living God... A living God? A living God sees, knows, is active, is present. I was reading through the Psalms this week, looking at some of the just action words that a living God does on behalf of his people. Let me share some of this with you. He says, he's near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit, leads us in paths of righteousness, is our mourning, sees our affliction, and camps around me, rescues me, equips me, supports me, shows me his steadfast love, answers what I call, makes known to me the paths of life, wipes away every tear, does justice for the fatherless and the orphaned, prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemy, restores my soul anoints my head with oil as a lamp unto my feet and says, if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. These are all actions, and dead gods don't have actions. Only living gods do. And we serve a living God. And if Jesus were dead, none of this was true, but he's alive, and so we have confidence. The same confidence Paul wrote in Romans 8 when he said, What then are we to say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can separate from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Why is that true? Because Jesus is alive. And Easter, billions of people gather to worship the living God who saved and changed and transformed their lives. And so the question is, don't you want what only the living God can provide? Life, salvation, joy, don't you want that? Today, 2,000 years later, we know it's possible, but I want to read to you the moment when people were just learning that this is true, this first Easter morning, and it's found in Luke chapter 24. Stand with me out of honor of reading God's word. Luke 24 verse 1 tells us, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead, asked the men. He is not here, but he has what, church? Jesus, you're alive. You're the living God. You see, you know, you change, you restore, you heal. Would you do that and so much more today in Jesus' name? Amen. Have a seat. And as you're sitting down, touch two people. Tell them he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive, but they didn't know it yet. If you look back at verse 1, it says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they... Those were women, the first to go to the tomb, came to the tomb bringing the spices. So really, they were the first Spice Girls, what you have here. (laughs) 
But they didn't know. And this first Easter morning was not a celebration. It was a time of mourning. In their mind, Jesus is dead. He'd raised others from the dead, but he's still in the grave. That's why they're there. They're bringing spices to care for the body of Jesus. So imagine tears stained the cheeks, sleepless, going to visit the dead body of Jesus. Verse 2. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in but did not find the body of Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified. You know, miraculously appearing angels have the tendency to do that. And bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? You see, people still today are looking for life in dead places. But he's not here. But he's risen. Look at the next verse. Remember, I love that, how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, it's necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. The angels are like, seriously? Seriously? And I love that verse, because the women get there, and they're like, where is he? Where's his body? What's happening? The angels are like, I am so shocked that you're shocked. There is a praise party in heaven going down right now. We were just there. We came here to tell you, why aren't you celebrating? You should be counting down 10, 9, 8, 7, move that stone. Like, what's going on? Jesus had told them over and over again, Luke 9, 22, Luke 9, 44, Luke 18, 31. This is going to happen. They kept hearing it, but they kept missing it. Did you know that still today you can hear the same thing over and over and over again and miss the main thing over and over and over again? It's possible to hear all the things and still miss the main thing. And so you need to know that like knowing things about Jesus, hearing things about Jesus is not the same thing as being saved by Jesus. And being saved by Jesus, that, that's the main thing. That's, that's what they told him here. Remember, it's necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise on the third day. That's the main thing. Jesus came to die for the sins of the world, be buried and rise again. Main thing. And then it says, and they were like, oh, yeah, I remember. And so they, they go back. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the 11 and to all the rest, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and all the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. Look at this. But these words seemed like what? Yeah, foolishness. Jesus isn't alive. Come on. Really? They had doubts. Some of you had doubts. Doubts and faith are not always mutually exclusive. If you've got doubts, you can make a pretty good disciple because the disciples doubted. Next verse. And Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. And I love John's gospel because John's gospel says that he and Peter ran to the tomb, but he beat him there. Like he wanted everybody for the history of the world to know I was faster than Peter. This is how competitive guys are. And when he stopped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what happened. Amazed. There's no way. Is it true? They couldn't explain it. They didn't fully believe it until they saw him and touched him. Is it true? And for the last 2,000 years, people have wondered, is it true? And they've turned the Middle East upside down looking for Jesus' body. They tried everything imaginable to disprove the resurrection, but no such luck. We may not have all the answers, and some of it may seem unexplainable, but when the unexplainable meets the undeniable, if God raised Jesus from the dead, and he did, I'm with him. I'm with the living God. Because, see, the resurrection is the story. If Jesus weren't alive... Like, if he is not the living God, then what was the point of his brutal death on the cross? I'm not belittling the cross. Jesus died for the sins of the world. 
But without the resurrection, it's meaningless. But the cross was significant because on the cross, Jesus took all of the punishment for our sin that we deserve and gave us all of the righteousness we needed from him. Look at what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He said, for our sake, he, that's God, made him, that's Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, he's sinless, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God, the great exchange. All of my sins Jesus bore, took, paid for. And his righteousness that I don't have and can't get on my own, he gave to me. We needed righteousness and we needed our sin paid for because sin is a serious issue. And the seriousness of sin, listen, isn't what we did or do. It's who we do it against. Let me give you an example. Let's say in about five minutes you get really bored with this sermon. You're like, come on, wrap it up, man. And I'm like, no, I'm going to keep preaching. And so you get mad and you, you storm out. I'm like, no big deal. We'll let you go. Not everybody likes about preaching. And on the way out, you kick the door. We're like, it's no big deal. It's just the door. And then you get in the parking lot and you're like, hey, there's a cone. You kick one of the cones. We're like, it's no big deal. It's just a cone. Then you see a cat. And you kick the cat. We'll actually give you a gift card. <laughs> just playing. That's, that's silly. It's getting late. I preached this six times. Just ignore that. But then, then you see one of our local police officers, and you're still mad, and you kick, you kick him or her. Do you still get to leave? No. Because who you kick determines how serious the kick is. And all sin is ultimately against God, a perfect God. And a perfect God requires either a perfect punishment or a perfect sacrifice. And sin deserves a perfect punishment. If Romans 3 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. So a perfect God gives a perfect punishment. And the perfect punishment is that the wages of sin is death. Romans 3, 23. God is perfect in his perfect punishment. But listen... God so ferociously loved us that he provided his son Jesus as the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. If you look back at Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, sure, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So on the cross, Jesus was that perfect sacrifice, and he rose from the grave defeating death and hell. And he makes life available to all who would believe because he's the living God. He was tortured so that we will never experience the torture of death. He was shamed by men so we don't have to live under the shame of our path. He was beaten so we don't have to beat ourselves up. And he rose again as the living God so we could have life now and in eternity. And see, we know all of that now. We're 2,000 years removed. But this morning that we're reading about in Luke, when they buried Jesus and the stone was rolled in front of the tomb, Jesus' followers thought he's dead. Enemies won. Checkmate. God's son, the king, is out of moves. He's gone over. Let me ask you a question. Show, them a hand, show of hands. How many of you have ever played chess? Heard about chess? No? Okay. I love chess because it's really like the ultimate game of strategy. And if you've ever played, you're thinking several moves ahead and you're setting up your opponent to make a mistake. And you're really waiting for the opportunity for their king to be exposed. And you're looking for just the right moment when, when the king is out of moves, no way of escape, and you move in, and that, that moment where you get to look him right in the eye with a big devilish grin and declare, checkmate, game over. Don't you know that's what Jesus' disciples must have been feeling when they pulled his body down off the cross? When, when they wrapped him in the linen cloths, helpless, hopeless, put him in a grave, 
and the stone was rolled in front of the tomb, in their minds, they had to be thinking, checkmate. The, the king is dead. He's out of moves. Can't you just imagine, as all this is happening, the devil like sitting back with a big grin on his face, looking at Jesus' tomb and thinking, checkmate. The king is done. He is out of moves. And did you know there's, there's actually a famous painting of the devil playing chess? Did you know that? Yeah, it's, it's called Checkmate. Look it up. It's a 17th century painting that hung in the Louvre for years. And there's a famous story about this painting. Because if you look, the devil, like he's, he's got this look on his face of victory. He's got him in Checkmate. And he's despondent. I don't have any moves. It's over. The king is out of moves. And so it's called Checkmate because the devil's won. And it hung in the Louvre, and many people visited it and looked at it. But there was one guy on one tour just enamored with it. So enamored that as his tour group moved on, he stayed put. The next tour group came in, he stayed put. The next tour group came in, he stayed put. And finally they came to him and said, so you really need to be with your group. He said, I, I understand, but this is this painting. It's spectacular. Like, I know, it's in the Louvre. He's like, what you don't understand is I'm a, I'm a grand master in chess. And I see things on a chessboard that other people don't see. And I've been looking at this painting for hours. And, and again, I'm, hey, I'm grand master. I see things that others don't see. And with all due respect, there's something wrong with the painting. The guy's like, come on, man. He's like, no, there's something wrong. So either you need to change the name or change the painting because the king's got one more move. Hey, it's not over for him. In fact, he, he doesn't know it, but he's actually got the devil in checkmate because the king's got one more move. 2,000, listen, years ago, the devil thought he had King Jesus in checkmate. The disciples thought King Jesus was out of moves, but Jesus kicked the end out of a borrowed tomb, defeated sin, hell, death, and the grave, and said, devil, wipe that smile off your face because the king's got one more move. If you remember, listen very carefully, on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. Listen, he didn't say, I am finished. Because the king had one more move. And if Jesus isn't finished, then we aren't either. We serve a living God. Every day of our life has got one more move. Every breath we take, the king has one more move. And he didn't come to crush you. He came to rescue you. But a dead God can't help you. But a living God can. A living king always has one more move. Our God's not out of resources. He's got one more move in your life, in your marriage, with your children, with your finances, with your sin, with your shame, with your guilt, with your addiction. He's got one more move. And if you're sitting at the chessboard of life, we don't have any moves. The Bible says we're dead in our sins. So you can't just go to church and expect that to work. I'm glad you're here, but that doesn't save you. Well, man, I'll try to do good, do good things. You should, but it doesn't save you. I'll try to stop sinning. Number one, you can't. It doesn't save you. I'll be better. I'll try harder. I'll even give money. Great. It doesn't save you. We don't have any moves. Jesus has all the moves. And he's already been crucified, buried, and rose again for you. The only move he asks from you is one of surrender. To say yes to him, to, to repent and believe that he has all the moves and you need it. See, I think that's why, that's why you're here today. The king brought you here 
so that you would know he sees you, he knows you, but he's got one more move he wants to make in your life. He wants to save you, make you his. And then every day of your life, one more move, one more move, one more move. A life of abundance and joy. See, that's why we asked you to grab this card because we want you to seriously think about it. Grab it. I want you to look at it. Notice, again, no address. We're not coming by your house. I'm not asking for you to look at this part yet. I'm a member of guest. I want you to look at this part where it says, I'm a Christian, ready to become a Christian or not sure. That is the most important declaration you can make in this world right now. And if you're already a Christian, then boldly declare that. But you don't become a Christian because of any action that you did. I was baptized. I did this. I didn't know. The only thing that makes us a Christian is repenting and believing in the one who died and rose again for us. That's it. And so if you're already a Christian, then mark that. If you're not sure, then mark that. We'll text. We'll email. Let's grab coffee. I love I was a skeptic for much of our life. Let's talk. I'd love to hear your story. But some of you, you're ready to become a Christian. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to call you down front. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm just going to pray with you. And you know that I'm talking to you in this moment. You can feel it in your heart. You don't have all the answers. You even feel nervous in this moment. I remember that at 19 years old going, man, I don't know what all this means, but I know He loves me and wants me. You're never going to have all the answers. But you know enough to know that there's one who loves you, has saved you, and is for you. And his name is Jesus. And I want you to say yes to him today. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I want you to pray with me. It's not an incantation. It's a conversation with the living God. And you know that I'm speaking right to you in this moment. Just say yes. Pray with me. Let us celebrate with you. And so I want us all just to kind of put, our, put ourselves in a position of prayer for the next moment. Just whatever that looks like or feels like to you, put yourself in a position of prayer. And for those of you that know right now you need to say yes to Jesus, the living God wants to save you and you want to say yes, pray with me right now. Say, dear God, I admit that I have no moves. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I believe that you're the living God. I believe it. Who was crucified, buried, and rose again for me. And I confess my need for you. Save me. Make me yours. Adopt me as your child. I believe in Jesus' name. You pray that he will. You are safe. You are secure forever. Pray that right now. Put it on the card. Turn it in. We can't wait to celebrate with you. Church, the king's got one more move. He's the living God. Let's stand. Worship him with one final chorus.
you guys see it.